Sounds good. Everybody ready? Okay, good, good, good. So, um, some of you may know my work, some of you may not. You may have seen some of these images before, uh, but I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about uh, how they were taken, certain settings, and just try and give you a good understanding as to uh, what the cameras can do uh, if set up appropriately. So I became a full-time photographer just over four years ago. It was completely unexpected and I had this absolute Hubble telescope of a setup. Uh, now because I come from a very sporty background, the weight and the size was never a problem for me, but it was inconvenient at some points. So I was extremely fortunate that when I became full-time, uh, pretty much within a month, Olympus approached me and said, do you want to try our kit? Now, up until this point, I'd been thinking, well, I'm happy with what I've got. Why should I change when I know what I'm doing with uh, the stuff that I've invested so much money and time in? But when you're offered a free trial of something, you don't say no. Um, so they sent me out the kit to uh, give it a go. Initially, it was the EM1 Mark I. Um, and if I'm brutally honest, I struggled with that system. Uh, going from a flagship DSLR to the Mark I felt like a huge jump. And for me and my style of shooting, it just didn't feel like the most appropriate piece of kit. But when they brought out the Mark II, it addressed a lot of the issues that I'd had with the camera. So I decided, let's give it a go. Let's see if these improvements are actually viable or if it's just marketing spiel. Um, so, I would say that I've been using Olympus specifically for about three years, uh, given some of the time that it took to get to grips with the system and get used to uh, its capabilities and uh, you know, being able to get the most out of it. Uh, and when it comes to wildlife, wildlife does what it wants. Uh, you can't tell it, can you please move a little bit? Can we get a different angle? It does what the hell it wants and we have to try our best to take images and capture some bits and bobs while they're off doing uh, their normal bits and bobs. So this was one of those such occasions where I was extremely lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. There is luck involved in wildlife photography, no matter how much time you dedicate to it. And this particular peacock was displaying on a farm courtyard. And um, we're obviously, uh, I've got a client with me, we're on a landscape workshop. But when we see this guy, naturally, we put that plan to the side. We want to try and photograph him. And we're sat on the edge of the courtyard. We didn't take a picture for about 45 minutes because he displayed behind a barbecue the entire time. We can't get an angle. A little bit annoying, but that's how it goes. And then eventually the farmer actually came along and said, go ahead on my land, take your pictures, have fun. And we thought that was problem solved. We can now get these images of this beautiful displaying peacock. No, unfortunately we still can't. He spent another 45 minutes wiggling his backside at us. We did not get to see his face once. And it wasn't until a female actually came along and he realized he'd been displaying to a white rabbit garden ornament the entire time, not a female peacock. She comes along and he actually turns around and realizes how much of an idiot he's been. And that gave us an opportunity to get a few images. Before she left, he went straight back to the rabbit. That was the end of that shooting session. But thankfully, I was able to get a couple of images um, that I hadn't yet gotten. Uh, and one of the key ones I wanted was as close to symmetry as possible, uh, peacock displaying. And I was really, really glad that in the selection of images I got, one of them was uh, what I was after. And this is another such example of just luck being on your side. Uh, I was in a hide on this particular day and we had been uh, just sitting, watching this woodpecker come in time and time again and land directly behind the post. So all we could see was just the outskirts of him sometimes peeping out of the sides. Pure dumb luck that when unforecast snow started and it was lovely massive flakes, this male actually came and landed on the side. Pure luck, the snow gave a little bit of atmosphere and depth uh, and it turned an average image into an okay image. Um, but for me, one of the things that I always struggled with with my old system was the weather ceiling. Any time that it was heavy snow, ice, rain, I was very concerned about my kit because I had actually had water damage in the past. With the Olympus, I don't worry about it. It doesn't matter what the conditions are. I've had it frozen on the top of the mountains in Scotland. I've dunked it in the sea accidentally. 
no problems. So I'm not saying dunk it in the sea, definitely do not do that. Um, but this camera is capable of taking a lot when it comes to the conditions and keeping on going. Now, adders at this time of the year, most of April, I should have been working with adders, but obviously we are all locked in our houses and we can't really get anywhere. Uh, adders are venomous, um, but they are an extremely timid snake. They will not bite you unless they absolutely feel it's necessary. Um, but all the same, I don't want to get too close to them. I don't want to upset, upset or disturb them. So this image in particular was taken with a 300 mil lens with a 1.4 converter on. As some of you may know, the minimal focal distance is 1.4 meters. So I can be a respectful distance away, not be afraid that I'm about to get bitten and have to go to hospital. Uh, the snakes are going to show some natural behavior. They're not going to be disturbed. Uh, and because the depth of field is a little bit wider as well, I'm able to get a little bit more detail in the image in comparison to whether I was using a uh, macro lens. And something that I don't do very much of, but I do dabble occasionally, is black and white or monochrome. Um, and uh, this particular beautiful female Ida, it was a very, very bright day. And it's the kind of day that usually I don't photograph in. But because she positioned herself in the shade uh, and behind was extremely bright, uh, bright it was sun bleached, uh, I was able to essentially white out the background and just have the detail of the female. And I felt like it worked really well in black and white. Now, if you don't have uh, some of the longer telephoto lenses, if you don't have the 300, the 40 to 150, maybe the Panasonic 100, 400, it doesn't mean that wildlife isn't accessible to you. It just means you have to adjust your approach a little bit. So I've worked with these squirrels for about three years. They're about a two and a half hour drive away, so they're not super close. But this was actually taken with a seven to 14 millimeter lens. So the, essentially it's a wide angle. I knew, because I'd spent a lot of time with them, what their general routines and behaviors were. And I know that they are extremely tolerant of people. So all I had to do is sit myself at the bottom of the tree and wait. Eventually this wonderful individual came along. Uh, I was absolutely filling my boots, getting as many pictures as possible. But even with my widest lens possible, it still wasn't wide enough for these darn squirrels. So it's typical, no matter how prepared you think you are, you're still not prepared. And in the end, all I could do is get my phone camera out, start taking pictures as I am getting mobbed by squirrels. Now, there's not much I can do about this except for enjoy the experience and hope that I had the images prior, which fortunately I did. <clears throat> Another place that I would usually be at this time of the year is on the coast. And I'm actually pretty gutted that we've had such lovely weather. And uh, apparently there's a lot of birds on the cliffs this year. And again, I'm sure that quite a few people in the group also had similar plans that have unfortunately been cancelled. But what I would usually be doing, um, I sleep in my car because I like to save money. Uh, and also I'm very comfortable in my car. I've got a little routine going on. But it means that when, this, when it's about to, the sun is about to rise, I'm there and ready. Um, what I now do that I have the EM1X is I have a power bank in my car so that I can charge my batteries, keep everything um, powered and up to date so I can stay out for several days with no problems. Whereas historically, I was limited by when my batteries run out, I'm going home. So it's nice to not have to worry about that too much uh, anymore. And this was one of those occasions when I accidentally dunked my camera in the sea. So there were about 12 people on the boat and I'm the only idiot who's hanging over the side using my articulated screen trying to get a super low angle. But unfortunately, when a bit of a wave comes over or a gannet dives in the wrong place, my camera ended up under more than once. Don't do that. It's salt water. I was panicking. I poured fresh water over it just to try and clean it up. And luckily it survived. And I was able to get some images I was reasonably happy with from a slightly different angle. And this is another example of using those wider lenses. You do not need a telephoto lens to photograph wildlife. Just pick your subject. So Arctic terns, if anyone's photographed them, they know that these guys are nasty. It's like having a fountain pen dropped on your head. Uh, if you come across one of the smart birds that's realized pecking your lens does nothing, you'll see they actually go for the fleshy bit on your trigger finger. 
So uh, some of these birds are really, really nasty. Uh, naturally, they're just trying to defend their nests that they have put directly on the public footpaths. Um, but if they don't manage to deter you with a bit of pecking, they have a second line of defense and it's really not fun. So you might see that there's a little bit of a projectile heading my way from the backside of this bird. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't end well. So the top layer of this image is not cloud. It is poop. Every single year I am on a coastal bird colony, this happens. So my best advice to you, mouth closed, keep your camera over your eyes, hope for the best. But something like this is guaranteed to happen sooner or later if it hasn't already. And um, I absolutely love working with coastal birds. They're one of my uh, main projects during the spring and summer years. I am hoping that if lockdown does eventually depart and we're able to get the COVID under control that I'll still be able to visit a little bit later in the season but right now it's not looking too great um, but I like to try and make the most of that minimal focal distance that you can achieve uh, with the 300 and also the 40 to 150. So this was with the 40 to 150 full uh, zoom so I'm at 150 or 300 mil equivalent and um, unfortunately, the sun had gone behind the clouds. I'd lost the light that I'd been waiting for, decided it's time to focus on something different. So I popped my shorter lens on, had a look around the paths. The puffins pretty much go to sleep right next to you. And this individual had nestled down right next to me. So it was a case of turning around. Again, I know I can focus 0.7 meters away. And I just sat and waited and waited until the puffin actually opened his eye. And you can see there's actually a lot of intricate detail in their eye, whereas from a distance, it just looks like a gray, just plain eye. So it's nice to be able to see the detail. Now this image was taken with the 300 mil and the two times converter. So this is a juvenile puffin. He's probably between three and four years old. And he'd come onto the colony, see what's going on, and uh, he was starting to do some really great displaying. Unfortunately, the conditions were the kind of light that I don't like to photograph puffins in, which is blue sky, bright, sunny. But because I was able to find this guy and the background was actually in shade, I underexposed quite significantly to black that background out and just isolate the puffin. Um, so this is an equivalent focal length of 1,200 mil. That two times converter, if it's used in the right conditions, will achieve pin sharp images. If the light is pretty, mm, and if the subjects move very erratically and quickly, that converter is not suitable. But I always have it with me because if you're looking for those opportunities, they will be there. Um, and I do have 100% uh, zoom images of quite a few of these if you want to see that up close detail. One of the other things that I constantly hear is Olympus cannot do birds in flight. Yes it can, it just needs to be set up correctly. So uh, one of the difficulties with being a full-time photographer is you actually don't spend much time taking your own pictures. Uh, and when I'm on colonies usually I'm running tours and workshops so I'm making sure that everybody else is okay. But it means that over time I've been able to figure out where the best spots are for flight shots, where the best shots are for flower shots, for example. And I knew within reason, if the wind was in the right direction, where I wanted to photograph flying puffins from. So last year I had my tours, they finished, and I stayed for a few more days with another photographer friend just doing my own work. The biggest difficulty was the background. There were always people in the backgrounds. <laughs> And when they have luminous yellow, green and blue jackets on, it really doesn't make your background very clean and very uh, aesthetically pleasing. So this particular puffin circled around 27 times trying to land in the burrow. But every single time there were gulls around or there were things getting in the way that was stopping him. But this meant that I knew averagely where he wanted to land. So I knew what focal length I needed. And as long as I could keep my eye on him, I could just follow him around and around and around. I utilize the AF limiter feature, which is highly, highly beneficial and will significantly increase uh, your rate of in-focus flight shots by ignoring the backgrounds and the foregrounds. And um, every single flyby, I got sharp images. 
but this was one of the only ones where I had a clean background as well and I didn't have people with bright jackets. So this was taken with a 300 mil and a 1.4 converter. Um, and yeah, I was very, very happy with the results. Uh, usually I like to photograph them when they are taking off or landing because you get the shape in the wings and you also get the feet out. Uh, and it was just pure dumb luck that the puffin that I picked happened to have sand deals in because not many were flying around with those on this day. This is another example of using a long lens for small animals and trying to get near macro results. So a common lizard is quite a small lizard that we have in the UK. And historically, again, I have usually used a 105 mil macro lens to photograph these guys. But that means the depth of field is extremely narrow and it's very difficult to be able to show them in context of their surroundings. This was taken, you'll have guessed it, with a 300 mil and a 1.4 converter. And 1.4 meters away, this particular female, she was at the bottom of a fence post. And all of this uh, stuff in the foreground was grass. So if I'd have been using my macro lens, I probably wouldn't have been able to work with her because I would have had to move through that grass. I risk knocking it onto her, upsetting her, she leaves. But by using the longer lens, I sat back exactly 1.4 meters away. I use my focus clutch so that it's in manual. And I basically just rock back and forth until I see um, that I'm in the right focal plane. You can use the focus peaking as well to help. And I was trying to use this grass, uh, this grass, grass as a natural frame. Um, and I was really pleased with the results. Um, it helped to isolate her a little bit more. She actually did some behavior, um, which is very, very rare for these guys. They usually just sit and sunbathe. Uh, and I was very, very happy with the results again. Now let's get some thumbs up. Who wants to go on a witching photography workshop? Let's get thumbs up. Who wants to go on one? It's going to be 20 pounds a head. Yeah. So uh, I think let's interrupt. I think that people aren't aware that you can actually do a thumbs up on Zoom, but uh, oh, yeah. um, we're still pretty new to it. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll go away now. Sorry, it's good to know though. Um, oh yeah, we've got thumbs up. Oh, this is fancy. You can tell this is my first Zoom talk, can't you? Um, Widgeons, especially where I am, we don't really get them uh, very much. I have to travel at least an hour to see them. But one of the things that pretty much all photographers are guilty of at some point is overlooking species because we deem them to be too common, not necessarily all that pretty, we're not that interested. So if I say widgeons, they're not as common, they are very pretty birds, they're nice to look at. So usually people are pretty interested in going to photograph them. What about mute swans? Who wants to go on a mute swan photography workshop? Let's get some thumbs up going. Oh, shock, there's less people interested. Now, mute swans, they are probably one of the most common species that we have in the UK. I can almost guarantee that everybody on this talk will have locations that you know of where you can go and see them. And usually they're in public areas, which means you can use a wide angle lens on them because they are not going to be afraid of you. Um, so at this particular site, uh, I absolutely love working here. And uh, this is an incomplete image. Um, I wanted to try and get one of them in the foreground, again, a natural frame, and another one in the background. Uh, so far, this is the only one where I've actually achieved kind of what I was looking for, except water droplets went straight across the uh, swan at the back so it distracts and it's just not complete for me but again it's another example of how you can use those wider lenses if you don't have a long one and this is at that same location at sunrise um, this site is very very messy it's completely surrounded by industrial estate buildings houses and the water is often covered in rubbish because people just throw it in there so i'd overlooked it very very harshly i thought no this is just not workable but I went back about six months later because I had absolutely no option and no idea where I wanted to go. And I realized that there is a small corridor that I can shoot down where the background's clean. I take a net so I can actually clean all the water in front of me because it drives me insane when you've got a crisp packet. just gradually floating in front of your subject. And uh, it's at this time of the year. So again, I'm a little bit disappointed I can't be there. But that sun rises directly aligned with the reservoir. So you can get some incredible light and color. And again, I'm hoping because 
the same will come around in autumn that I will be able to go and make the most of uh, that sun directly lining up with this location. Now, who wants to go on a Canada Goose Photography Workshop? Let's get a thumbs up. Everybody's so excited. It's 20 pounds a head, remember. <laughs> um, so as time goes on, obviously, Canada Geese, slightly less interesting to some people. Now, this particular image was taken at around about seven o'clock in the evening in winter. So it's pitch black, can't see anything. And that one little bit of light is actually reflected from a street light. So I'd been at this location quite a bit. Um, I'd been going home reasonably late. Obviously the light had all gone. And I realized that there was this light here. And I thought to myself, something will line up with that that will work really, really nicely. Um, so it took a week to get a Canada goose that would actually stay still long enough. Um, the settings on this, ISO 3200 and the shutter speed was 15, a fifteenth of a second. So pretty darn slow. Uh, that's how dark it was. But I had to go to those settings, otherwise I wouldn't get anything. So by using sequential shooting with the burst mode so that any slight movement from the bird would hopefully be overridden if I had more frames, I was able to get quite a few um, from this selection. And I was very happy with the noise. I have not done noise reduction on this image. It's at 3200 and honestly, I think it's pretty darn good. Thumbs up, who wants a mallard workshop? Still 20 pound ahead. Who's excited about mallards? Now, often when um, I mention to some people that I'm doing a mallard photography um, project during winter, I get faces of, are you that desperate that you're going to do a mallard project? And my answer is, well, if you actually just look at these birds and ignore the fact that they are so common, they are visually stunning. And if you think back to, let's just say 40 years ago, when water voles were prevalent and you could find them on most waterways, if that was the modern day, would photographers be as eager to go and photograph them because they are so common? Or is it just the fact that they are rare that now pushes people to want to go and see them? Mallards are actually an amber listed bird. And just because they are common now does not mean that 10, 20, 30 years down the line uh, that their numbers are not going to drop. And again, just because they're common doesn't mean you can't take good pictures of them. I absolutely love mallards. The time that I've spent with them, I've started to realize they have pretty quirky personalities. They're quite fun birds to spend time with. And uh, if you just get a little bit creative, you can get some nice stuff with them. So don't limit yourself by just saying, I want to do those rare species. Focus on the common species as well, because you can guarantee you can find them. You can guarantee within reason that they are going to be a little bit easier to work with. And that means you can focus more on your images, your composition, trying to be artistic, rather than hiding in a bush, worrying that one snap of a twig is gonna scare everything away. Um, and these are one of the birds that I sometimes do work with during the day. Um, I've got a couple of sites where, again, I've got a shaded background. So if I can get a bird in the sun against that backdrop, I can essentially isolate the bird completely and you can get some quite nice results. Thumbs up. Who wants a pigeon photography workshop? Pigeons, anyone? No? I, I don't need pity thumbs up. <laughs> I can see some pity thumbs up going on. <laughs> Again, if I said to you guys, let's go and do a pigeon photography workshop, you're going to look at me funny and you're going to say, no, I'm really not interested. But I can almost guarantee that everybody will know where to go and find pigeons. And again, I use a wide angle lens on them. I like to try and bring out some of their personality and their quirkiness. You can get some nice stuff with pigeons. So I challenge everybody in the room, go and photograph pigeons or mallards. And you will be very surprised at some of the results you can get if you dedicate yourself to it. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll get pigeons moving up in the ranks in terms of photography popularity. Now, one animal that's definitely very popular, especially in winter, is mountain hares. And I'm very, very fortunate that I live in the Peak District where we have the only English population of these wonderful mammals. Uh, if I want any wintry conditions, I have to go to Scotland because a lot of the roads end up closing in the, the Peak District and I can't get to the sites. Um, but these animals are incredible to work with. So this was taken with a 300 mil 
I am pretty darn close to this hair and I just wanted to get the detail of the whiskers, excuse me, uh, and the nose. And again, I was able to utilize the fact that technically the uh, micro four thirds lenses have a wider depth of field. Uh, so I didn't have to stop down my aperture to be able to get some of that detail. And this is what I usually look like if I'm up in Scotland. Um, so this particular hair is called Beardy. Um, Beardy was named by a photographer called Andy because uh, he's got like a Santa Claus beard down his chest. He was a very, very wonderful hair. He was incredible to work with and he was very confiding if you approached him appropriately. Um, I know that there's a question from somebody about mountain hair approaching and fieldcraft, so I will go over that uh, in the question time as well. Um, but with this particular uh, image, I'd spent a couple of hours gradually crawling closer to Beardy after spending several days with him at a distance using that 300 mil. It was pouring it down with rain. It was disgusting conditions. I started with the 300 mil on, and over that time, I crawled closer, closer, closer. I ended up with a 12 to 40 mil lens on, and I was able to get a selection of images that I was pretty happy with, except for the fact that he sat in a ditch. So all of the mountain and the golden light and everything that I wanted to try and capture because of the angle, I couldn't quite show it. But it's an image progress and hopefully at some point I will get what I was originally after. This particular hair was called Mrs. Grey. Um, if you have been to Scotland to photograph mountain hares or if you've seen images coming out of there, the chances are you have seen photographs of this incredible hair. Uh, she was really, really special, uh, temperament unlike pretty much any hair I've come across. This hair was bomb proof. And that meant that if you, uh, pretty much if you just turned up, you would be able to get close and get images of her. So knowing where her snow hole was on this particular day, uh, I had gradually crawled closer and I just waited, knowing that she was going to be back at some point. To put it into context, she would literally sit right next to you and eat and run around you. So this was a one in a million kind of hair. But one of the things that I did, I wouldn't say wrong, um, but one of the things in my early career was I wanted to fill the frame all the time. But that doesn't show the animal in context of the surroundings. It doesn't show the habitat. It doesn't tell you the full story. So that's why sometimes I leave my long lens in my bag or at home, and it forces me to think a little bit differently and look for those different opportunities. And this was uh, a portrait of Mrs. Gray. Uh, it was very dark. The sun had set. She was in a ditch, and uh, we were in a, uh, just above her. 300 mil lens, f4. And I was still able to get the detail of her nose all the way to the back of her eye. Because it was very dark, the shutter speed was around about a hundredth of a second. If I had been using my older kit, which is substantially heavier, doesn't have as good an image uh, stabilization, and also it's a full frame, so the depth of field is narrower, I would not have been able to achieve this image because putting the aperture up to get the depth or uh, slowing the shutter speed down to try and isolate and keep everything pin sharp, it would have been very logistically difficult. Whereas on this occasion, I didn't have to worry about it. It was pretty simple. Now, I'm going to assume that quite a few people have uh, heard of or used Pro Capture. Uh, Pro Capture is something that I don't, if I'm brutally honest, I don't use it very often, but there are occasions which are perfect for it. And for me personally, when I'm cold, I lose all dexterity in my hands. So my brain will tell my finger, press the shutter button, and maybe two seconds later, it will actually do it. I'd been waiting for Mrs. Gray with a couple of other photographers whilst it poured it down with rain. But we knew eventually she would have to shake off because she would just become so waterlogged, it's uncomfortable and it's gonna get her cold. Because she spent so long just hunkered down doing nothing, I'd been trying to experiment with other shots, slow shutter speed, some video, and when it came to her actually shaking off, I wasn't prepared. I managed to get three shots because I was still on sequential mode. But in hindsight, I really wish that I'd had Pro Capture on because I would have been able to get every single frame. I would have been able to be very particular about which image from that selection I chose. And it was pure dumb luck that the shot that I got had her eye open and often when they shake, they uh, crunch their eyes and they kind of uh, scrunch up. 
she actually had her eye open. I was able to get a bit of movement on that front paw and obviously the water was spraying everywhere. So I was lucky that I still got the shot I was after, but I really do wish that I had utilized Pro Capture in this instance. Um, I didn't get to go to Scotland uh, this year uh, for a variety of reasons, including uh, uh, coronavirus popping up. Um, but Lady is another very, very special hair up there. Absolutely love this hair to bits, except for the fact that Lady is actually a male. So hairs, they don't really give you any indications as to whether they're male and female until they want to. Uh, myself and again a couple of other photography friends we've been calling her lady for about two weeks and the day I went home I get a message lady's not a lady <laughs> that's good well the name's stuck now unfortunately um, the chances are next winter lady will no longer be there hairs have an average two to four year lifespan so I'm hoping and praying that lady does survive and I'm able to get some pictures of him next winter because again this is one of those unique hairs that are extremely confiding and wonderful to work with. Now <clears throat> Lake Kikini is somewhere that I had wanted to go for quite some time but because it's a reasonably cheap trip and you can book it short term every winter when it came time for me to go and photograph them something else would come up or I'd find a reason not to go. Um, I changed that a couple of winters ago, decided I'm going out there, I'm not going to keep making excuses, I'm going out there for a week, hopefully get some really nice conditions and get some nice images. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in the end, I had a week of cloud and dreary, dismal conditions, um, but in fact, it ended up working in my favour because uh, I was able to use that, those foggy or bright backgrounds to isolate the subject again. Now on this lake there's quite a few, there's probably four or five hundred Dalmatian pelicans, but of those individuals you do find unique ones. So some have orange eyes, one orange, one blue. <clears throat> some have damaged pupils like this, and it's usually those unique individuals that I'm actively trying to find to photograph. I love the ones that just stand out a little bit from the crowd. <clears throat> Again, when I'm on the boat, I'm the idiot hanging over the side, utilizing that articulated screen to try and get a nice low angle. So I was on the boat, uh, the water wasn't mill pond, it was a little bit rough, um, but again, just hanging over the edge using that screen, I was able to get some angles with a wider angle lens. <clears throat> and one of the um, rarer visitors of Lake Kikini is the great white pelican. I'm very aware that this is actually pink pelican, not white. Um, they turn a pinky rosy color uh, during the breeding season. Now for, I would probably say there's 20, maybe 30 individuals on the lake compared to hundreds of Dalmatian pelicans. And usually they all bunch up and they actually bully and pick on the great white pelicans, which makes me feel sorry for them and want to spend time with them and photograph them. And this particular individual had incredible plumage. The pinks and the colours, the bill was wonderful. So all I wanted was one photo. It was difficult because guaranteed 99.9% .9 of the time there was a Dalmatian pelican in the front or in the back or a tail or a bill. So isolating just one bird in a group of 30 of them was not very easy, but thankfully I was able to do it. Again, lying on the edge of the lake, using that screen to get the lowest angle possible. And this is another example. Uh, so it was foggy, so I'm able to essentially white out the background. And I just liked this individual because, again, he's got that unique pupil, that unique marking that makes him stand out. So I was really enjoying trying to just get portraiture of these birds as well. Portraiture is one of my key focuses. I really love uh, using and doing those styles of images. So this particular image was taken with the 300mm lens and the two times converter. It's a great white pelican again, and I really wanted to just get a really up close shot of the face, showing some of that detail, uh, especially in um, their pouch. Because they fight a lot with the other birds, you'll see that there's some blood going on and also on the bill. Um, I really wanted to be able to show this detail. But every time I tried to get the shot, I was cutting off the top um, where the pink skin becomes plumage and feathers. It took forever 
to get the shot that I'd actually been after, but thankfully I managed it. And again, you can see that fine detail. So it is possible to get very good images with that two times converter. But one of the things I was really, really wanting to do out in Greece is try and find something other than pelicans because the pelicans are stunning, they are incredible, but I don't want to go out there and just come back with pelicans. So when I wasn't photographing them, I was driving down dirt track roads, trying to find something a little bit different. And I eventually found it with these guys. Now, I initially thought it was a beaver and I was absolutely thrilled to bits that I had found a beaver in Greece. But there were a few things that didn't quite add up. The tail was wrong, the habitat was wrong. There were seven of them together on the edge of the river. So I Googled rat like beaver or rodent like beaver, Greece. And the first result that came up was koipu, to which my response was, what is a koipu? I've not heard of this. Easily one of the top three species I photographed in the world because the personality that these animals possess is incredible and it really does come across on the images as well. So when I initially found them, I decided, mm, are the pelicans actually important anymore or do I want to just spend time with these guys? Um, I had to crawl through a, between around about 50 meters of quagmire to get to the edge of uh, the water to be able to photograph them. And they were sitting on uh, dead trees, dead logs that were just floating in the water. And because in the background there were reeds, it made really nice color and reflection on the water. And these guys are honestly incredible. If you ever get the chance to go and see and photograph them, please do. You will see why I fell in love with them as much as I did. So this was taken with the two times converter, the 300 mil, I'm pretty sure this is a 300 mil lens. And it was the only day, I've been in Greece for two weeks, it was the only day that I actually had decent light at sunset. And uh, the sun sets behind a big mountain range, so you don't get that last light that you can get at other places. And I was lying on the edge of the water and there was nothing in front of me. And the colour and the light was incredible. And I was just sat praying and begging, please, something. I don't care what it is. Swim in front of me. Let me get one picture. Go about your day. And I knew that there was one of the paths that they used pretty close to me. This male came out, swam right in front of me. And you can't imagine how excited I was trying to get these shots. I have not touched the color. That is how vibrant and beautiful and golden the conditions were. Uh, and again, just a little bit of luck, right place, right time, and the animals actually behaved as I'd hoped they would. But you'll see that uh, a lot of my work does utilise those longer lenses to get closer to those smaller subjects. So I was in Uganda for this particular image. I was in the middle of Kampala. There's not much wildlife in Kampala. And ironically, the car broke down. And I am very frustrated at this point because we have no air conditioning. We have somewhere to be. And... Yeah, it's not a great situation. If you think the AA are slow to reply in the UK, you've not worked with Africa times because you're lucky if you get a mechanic out within three days. So I'm a little bit frustrated, a little bit annoyed. Whatever, it is what it is. Pure dumb luck that we'd actually broken down next to a wall that had two Southern Rocker Garmas displaying on. So this male, he was displaying by doing push-ups. Again, I sat on the car, 300 mil, 1.4 converter, I filled my boots, took absolutely umpteen photos because I'm not going anywhere. I may as well make the most of this opportunity. And when I've been on safari previously, especially for the little lizards, unless you're very, very lucky, they're usually just a little bit too far off the path. So you see them, but you can't get close. You can't get those intimate images. So this was one of those situations where a bad situation actually turned into a good one. And for my sins, I was in Japan at the end of uh, January into February before things really, really kicked off. Um, I was very fortunate that uh, I had a week in Hokkaido. It wasn't specifically photography focused, but we did have a couple of days where we were able to go to locations and get some images. And the best day by far was working with these beautiful swans. So in the UK, they can be a little bit tough to track down and get close to. But in Japan, because they're so used to people and they go to the hot springs to keep warm, um, they are a lot easier to approach and photograph. 
I was overcoming food poisoning on this particular morning. I really wasn't feeling great. Um, I was lying on a frozen lake. It was about minus 20 degrees. It was very, very cold and it was blizzard. So it was nasty, but they were actually really good uh, uh, conditions to be able to take photos in. Um, and because it was a little bit windy as well, the clouds were getting pushed over and we would occasionally get some nice bright light as well. So there was a range of conditions, weather conditions and light conditions that made this a really, really good two hours in the morning. And I was absolutely filling my boots, freezing to death half the time because I was having to take my gloves off. Um, but when you're out shooting and you're getting good stuff, you don't really think about what's happening with your body until you're finished. Um, I do not personally use the CAF plus tracking. Uh, I just use CAF. And when these birds were flying in, running in, moving around, again, I was just trying to make sure that I had that single autofocus point on the head. Uh, obviously, the neck means that the head is at a different focal plane to the body. Uh, and I was really, really pleased with some of the results I was able to get. One of the things I wanted to try and do was get one of the birds flying in when they were surrounded by the others that were set on the hot spring. I got a few that I was reasonably happy with, but I was especially happy with this one. Um, again, just utilizing CAF without tracking. Personally, I always shoot at plus two sensitivity um, so that the moment something moves into your autofocus point, the camera will readjust and lock on. Um, and yeah, this was one of those occasions you can see the sun is just starting to come out. So the light and the conditions, the mood, everything was really, really special on this evening. And this was taken with, uh, again, that two times converter uh, on the 300 mil. I didn't want to get too close to the birds, so I was staying a respectable distance back. Obviously, there's other photographers there as well, so I don't want to get in their shot. Um, so by using the two times, I was able to get a lot closer without physically getting closer. And this, was, this image was taken when it was actually quite dark. So it's not optimal conditions for that converter. But again, I was able to get some results I was very, very happy with because they weren't moving too much. Now, one of the things that I think is extremely important as a wildlife photographer is to be able to understand field craft, to be able to understand the signs, trails, tracks that animals leave behind to allow you to be able to hopefully go and find them and photograph them. So there's certain species like puffins, you can Google it. Puffin Locations UK, there's a nice long list of uh, places you can go. And as long as the boats run, you're almost guaranteed to see and photograph them. But for other species, it's not always quite that simple. So a lot of the work that I put into just basically being able to track and understand the signs that wildlife leave behind, it was because I really wanted to see and photograph badgers. So up until this point, I had never seen a live one. I'd only seen them dead on the side of the road, which is never a nice thing to see. Um, and it's not like you can just pop uh, to your local pub or to your local photographers and say, do you mind giving me some uh, locations where I can go and photograph badgers? So it took quite some time to find a suitable site. Um, but when I eventually did, the initial idea was this is going to be a project for a year. Hopefully I'll get a reasonable portfolio and then I will move on to a new subject next year. Uh, obviously I would still visit, but uh, it wouldn't have been my primary focus. So it's nearly five years on. <laughs> this is definitely not just a short term project. Uh, these guys are my absolute world. I am mortified that I can't be visiting them right now because uh, they are in the middle of nowhere. So I wouldn't see anybody. But again, I need to stick to uh, lockdown rules. and. Um, they are incredible animals. They are so heavily misunderstood uh, and misrepresented in the media as well. Um, each badger that I work with has a name, has a personality. Uh, this particular badger is called Bear, absolutely loved Bear. Um, the dominant so Luna, she usually has around about three cubs a year. And usually they don't leave until they are two years of age. Uh, at some point over winter, they just disappear and they go to find new families, new homes. But because I've worked so extensively at this site, I have genuinely been there for thousands of hours. It means that I have to really push myself to try and get new and unique stuff. So I utilize uh, the uh, Wi-Fi control quite a bit on the cameras. 
So what I do, uh, I will connect one of the cameras with a wide angle lens to my iPad. I will pop it at an angle where I can't physically see it. Um, obviously I could take into account light um, where the paths are, where the set entrances are. So I will leave that camera. I've got my iPad, I can control my settings, I can see exactly what's happening. And then I'm sat a little bit further back with a longer lens on, getting different angles, different light, different shots. So it's essentially like getting two birds uh, with one stone. And um, I do camouflage it up. I've put mud on them, I've put leaves on them, I've covered them with camouflage. Frankly, these badgers do not care to the point where half the time they end up playing with it, knocking it down, uh, down the mound and I can't get any photos for the rest of the day because I can't go and move it, unfortunately. Um, but because they are just so comfortable, they don't really mind the camera being there. It means that I can get very intimate shots of them when things go right, because usually things don't go right. And the badgers obviously just do what they want. I get a nice badger bum. They play with the camera. They knock it over. I can't do anything. I just have to hope they don't damage it beyond recognition. But occasionally uh, I do get shots that I am reasonably happy with. Again, silent shutter. The badgers can smell it, but they are not bothered by it. So I'm able to get those angles, use those uh, wider lenses with no um, negative impact on them. <clears throat> and my primary lens for photographing them is with a 40 to 150. Uh, again, because they are comfortable with me, I don't have to sit way back in a tent or behind a tree. Um, so again, it allows me to be able to uh, utilize that flexible focal length. And again, it's in a woodland, so it's quite dark. I need to be able to get as much light as possible. Um, so utilizing that 2.8 um, aperture is very, very handy as well. And uh, honestly, if you haven't photographed badgers or spent time with badgers, I highly recommend it. And you will see very, very quickly why I have fallen in love with them as much as I have. This particular badger was called Lissa. Lissa is uh, extremely special. Um, I absolutely loved her to bits. Uh, and she was always a very, very bold, brave uh, cub when she was younger. She was the first badger to ever approach me. Uh, and, and that's when everything changed pretty much. And again, this is utilizing that wide angle lens. So I've just put the camera there. Camouflage uh, is just a net gator, cost two pounds around it. I'm sat to the left uh, and yeah, the badge comes out and I am just tapping on my iPad. Wherever you tap, it focuses, takes the picture. Um, so it's really easy to do both at the same time, except badges are usually London buses. So when one comes out and starts performing for one of the cameras, you can guarantee another one comes out and starts performing for that camera. And I've got to make a choice of which, do I use my camera with me now or do I take shots from the iPad? And because these guys are so used to me now, uh, I'm really eager to try and get detail sh shots again. Um, so a badger's snozzle, this is uh, the primary thing that they focus on. This is uh, extremely sensitive. Uh, they need it obviously to eat, get around, follow badger paths. And all I wanted was a detail shot of a badger nose. Uh, they obviously have the nice little hexagonal bits like a dog. They never stay still long enough while it's still light. It's always when the sun has gone down. And it's very frustrating because I need them to stay still. I need them to look directly at me so it's nice and symmetrical. And I need to get a sharp image. So usually they are really, really giddy when they come out before sunset. The moment the sun sets, they start to calm down a little bit, relax, get ready for a night on the town. So usually these images are taken with non-optimal settings, 3200 ISO, my aperture is wide open, 2.8, and uh, the shutter speeds are usually around about a tenth or fifteenth of a second. So it's a case of, again, utilizing that sequential mode, taking a few more shots than I, than I need um, to remove any risk of having motion blur if they moved on one of the shots. And again, this is another uh, bad light situation. Uh, Luna had come out because I know the badgers um, individually and I know their behavior because Luna is essentially blind she has very bad cataracts in both eyes whenever she emerges she will freeze in place and listen to and smell her surroundings to try and assess whether it's safe when I saw her come out I knew I could get this shot because if it had been a cub or a sub-adult they never stopped moving and the shutter speed that I required 
was far too slow. So this was taken at a 15th of a second. And again, the moment I saw Luna, I knew I could get the shot. So sometimes it's more important to understand your subject, the species, their behavior, than it is to understand the intricacies of your camera and uh, photography. <clears throat> and this is um, one of the last images that I took of Lissa. And for me personally, it's my favorite. So badgers are very, very clean animals. They do not like to be dirty. They don't like to have parasites. Who would? So as a form of social bonding, but also just to keep clean and feel good about themselves, they will groom several times a night, pretty much every night. And badgers look incredible when they're doing this. It's extremely comical. Um, but you can almost guarantee whenever they do it, the light is far too dark, can't get any shots. It's behind a bush. It's behind another tree. It's behind another badger. Every single time, the conditions are not right for it. And this was the only occasion that I can remember where everything came into place. So again, the light looks good. It was not, I was using a slow shutter speed, but knowing the way that Lissa grooms, she goes absolutely wild and then she gets bored or she gets tired and she just stops. And I knew when she did this, there's the shot, slow shutter speed doesn't matter. I will be able to get some images. So this was the combination of about 2000 hours spent there to get one image that I had been after for four years. So I would say it was worth it. I was very happy with the results. Uh, now I'm trying to get a yawning badger and I'm still failing horrifically at that. So hopefully if I ever can leave the house again, I will get back on that. And maybe in another five years, I will have that image. So I'm going to finish this little presentation talk with a short video. If you cannot hear it, um, wave violently at the camera uh, and I will try and fix it, but otherwise, please enjoy.
Thank you very much, Tesney. That was just absolutely amazing. Um, but uh, we, we do have quite a lot of questions. Uh, I, I'm, just, I'm very much conscious of the fact that it's 10, an hour and 10 minutes already, but do you want to, do you have time for just a, a few more questions? So- I'm Not going anywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna scroll through very quickly um, and try and pick out some of the more interesting ones. So um, uh, there was a question about the, the, the focus, Tracking. Um, uh, you did mention that you use CAF in a, in a simpler mode, but do you do you use the AI mode on the EM, EM1X at all, or, or, or would you like? You know, are you hoping Olympus is going to do that? So I am hoping that it happens, but I also recognise just how much work it takes to put together a profile. So from my understanding, you need round about twenty thousand images of one let's just say uh, a cheetah from all different angles so that you can put it into an algorithm and it can recognize uh, the face and the eye if you think of just how many um, different species uh, there are in the world and how different uh, their eyes and face and profiles are it's difficult and it's 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 a long drawn out process to be able to put that kind of thing together so i do hope it's in the works i do hope that um it does eventually arrive but I also don't, I recognize that it will take time. So I will use it if it comes about, but I will only, if I'm brutally honest, use it in low risk scenarios. I always like to be in control as best I can with the camera so that if anything goes wrong, I can blame myself and uh, not blame the camera, so to speak. Okay, uh, this is a, an equipment question. Do you use back button focus and what's your go-to birds in flight settings it's quite technical that question but if you can answer briefly so uh yes i use back button focus except for when i'm doing birds in flight uh then i just utilize my shutter button um i use mode four for my back button focus um caf sensitivity plus two uh af limiter uh, i use as well and i've got that assigned to my lens function button um and then, yeah, obviously, depending on the light conditions, how fast uh, the subject or the bird is moving, uh, that will also um, change what my settings are as well, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, Mark, Mark Caton has asked, uh, are all your shots handheld or do you use a monopod or other support? 99.9% uh, .9 are handheld. Um, there's probably the odd one where I've propped myself against a post or something, um, but I choose to carry all my equipment um knowing i can handhold it rather than also carrying a monopod a tripod etc um so unless i'm going to be fixed in place and i'm definitely not moving uh, i don't use um tripods or monopods okay um i've got a question from mark farrington about me metering he 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 has found that the em1 mark three seems to have slightly different metering response to the mark two have you noticed that Personally, I haven't, no. Um, I just use centre-weighted, um, and in my opinion, metering is still important, but it's less important when you are uh, have live feedback. Um, so obviously you've got the, if you've got a uh, live, boost, uh, live view boost off, um, you can see the exposure. I use a highlight alert so that I know if I'm blowing any highlights or anything, um, but otherwise I don't rely on my metering. Um, and yeah, I've not noticed a difference personally. Okay, uh, Cindy Howells uh, asks how much cropping you do in post-processing? I try not to do too much. Sometimes, yes, I do do it a little bit to get the composition or the frame a little bit better. Um, but usually I will not crop so that my longest edge is uh, less than 4,500, if that makes sense. Okay, I try to keep it minimal. Fantastic. Um, Greg Coyne has asked, um, I'd like to have known how the artistic mallard shots, a shot was taken. Can, can you explain her, uh, sorry, can you explain your method and settings? Slow shutter speed, it was about a fifth of a second. The mallards were uh, being fed by some of the locals. So I literally just stood there, handheld, slow shutter speed uh, and relied on their movement to be able to add um, that effect in. Um, there's a question here about <clears throat> lenses. Um, 
so Andrea, who, who's in Italy, oh, hi Andrea, um, has asked about, do you use the 75 to 300 at all? Um, and um, uh, there was also some questions about the new one, uh, the, the new long Olympus Zoom. Are you using that and how are you getting on with it? So I don't have that lens. I don't even think that a real life version exists yeah. yet. Um, I can't wait for it because I've been wanting something like that for a long, long time. And personally, I don't like the one to 400 panny. I don't like the zoom ring and the, there's just bits I don't get on with. Um, I don't, don't use the 75 to 300. Um, I will, I will opt for 40 to 150 on one camera, 300 on another camera. Great. Okay. Um, there was a question from, from the, from the forum, which I, I think is a great question. So I'm going to ask it for you. This was, um, again, from Mark, Mark Farrington. So you've got two bites of the cherry, Mark. Um, uh, I'll read it as he wrote it. So if she could go anywhere next year on a two week wildlife shooting contract with complete artistic freedom, where would she go and what would be her project? So basically, what's your dream? <laughs> uh, I have a few that I really want to do, but if I was just told, you can go where you want, don't worry about money, don't worry about time, it would be Antarctica. Um, I would love to go there. I hate the cold, but it just looks so incredible. Um, yeah, I would love to go there. Okay, that's great. I, I think a lot of people's questions have been answered in the presentation. I don't think we can cover all of them so i think we'll you know we've been going now for an hour and 16 minutes and i think um we're all thinking about lunchtime now so I, i'm going to bring it to an end now um thank you so much for your time i know it's tremendously difficult for people like yourselves creatives you know who 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 need to get out there and meet people like us to make 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 your living uh, but we all need to stay safe and um uh, you know things like this are, are keeping our chins up i think so thank you so much uh, i'm speaking on behalf of most people um so i don't know what your what 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 your day is and and what what you can do is there much you can do from where, where you where you live and uh, uh, is there much outside the window and things like that i've been trying desperately to bring birds into the garden because uh, we're in a little bit of a bird dead spot um, I've managed wood pigeons, um, so <laughs> uh, I need to eat my own words and do something with those wood pigeons. Um, but I, I've been really struggling to get stuff um, to the garden, so it's been it's been tough, if I'm oh, honest. Okay. Um, but it gives me time to do my admin and all of the stuff that's been on the to do list for a year, and I haven't gotten around to. <laughs> and so do every still finding. And doing things like this. So thank you very much. Um, I wish you well. And uh, I can see us arranging some workshops for the, for the members, you know, um, a group of us. It, we, we all know each other on the forum and maybe approaching you uh, to do workshops once we can get out again. So thank you again. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And yeah, thanks, Taisley. Yeah, thank you, Thank you Thank you Thank you. I'm sorry about the latecomers. Um, we will be aiming to put this on on the YouTube channel, so you, you'll be able to catch up then. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks for you. Bye. 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 Bye.